but not least, and I'm just going to put the overview slide up while Professor um, while Professor Peaster talks, because he said he has no slides. He's just going to use uh, puppets, is it, or shadows? That's right. I have no slides. So I'm in ECS. Um, We've got about 80 faculty and uh, probably just about as many projects that we came up with. Uh, and I'm just going to talk to you about one of them. That's an idea that Bernard Bozer and I have been kicking around. So we, we started wireless sensor networks at Berkeley back around 15 years ago. Was, there was a project called Smart Dust uh, that we did that kind of kicked off this idea that you can make really tiny wireless sensor nodes uh, that can be self-powered. and that kind of created an industry. And there are a lot of universities and a lot of companies that contributed, but Berkeley played an absolutely central role uh, in that evolution. A whole bunch of startups uh, came out of Berkeley, and there are a bunch of them now. So Adura, for example, is doing uh, wireless lighting control uh, in buildings. That's a Berkeley startup. Uh, Federspiel Controls, uh, another Berkeley startup, is doing energy monitoring in buildings. So they go in. What, what Cliff Federspiel discovered was that he could go into a building like this one and uh, just putting little tiny uh, battery-operated wireless temperature sensors around inside the, the building, uh, but using the exact same control infrastructure, so the same heating systems and cooling systems, the same valve controllers, whatever was there already, more sensors, better algorithms, and the same control infrastructure, he could actually increase the occupant comfort in the building and decrease the energy consumption. And so it was a win-win. And his company is doing great now. They're off doing data centers because it turns out that the, the occupants that you most care about keeping happy are servers. Uh, people pay the most money for that. Um, so uh, street line networks, if you drive around in San Francisco while you're uh, up here, uh, any, any place in San Francisco now where there's a parking space, you're likely to see a little lane marker glued down on the street. But it's not a lane marker that's in the middle of the street like you're used to, a you know, little four inch uh, square. It's next to the parking space, and that's monitoring uh, the presence or absence of vehicles that gets wirelessly sent back to the city uh, and to the street line infrastructure and you can actually find the nearest open parking space to your favorite restaurant um, and uh, you know, all sorts of neat stuff going on there. So, so the point is this technology uh, was research uh, 10 or 15 years ago and it's become commercial, it's broadly deployed. Another thread, all this stuff, all, all these wireless sensors run off batteries uh, they can get lifetimes of five to ten years off of a battery, even as a routing node, even as an IPv6 router uh, in the internet. Um, but even five to ten years is sort of a pain, right? Then you've got to go and replace all those batteries or replace that sensor node. So there's a lot of excitement now about doing energy scavenging and using, for example, the light in the room on a solar cell to get your power or using a temperature difference. So for example, in right, this room there's a heating and uh, air conditioning system that kicks on every 5, 10, 20 minutes or so and either raises the temperature a couple of degrees or lowers it depending upon what the, the ambient is doing. And that temperature difference, if you're sitting against some, let's say, you know, any sort of decent sized piece of metal like this, this stays pretty much isothermal. So if you have a little uh, Peltier device with a little uh, uh, heat sink on it, you can, you can scavenge the, the, the heat flow into and out of that um, as the room is cooling and heating. Vibration anywhere that you find, you can scavenge energy off of that. So there's a bunch of different scavenging mechanisms that you can use to uh, generate the microwatts of power that you need to power wireless sensors. So the, the, the kind of project that we're interested in is taking more or less off-the-shelf wireless uh, networking technology, the wireless sensor network technology. There's a whole bunch of startups that are doing the scavengers, so taking off-the-shelf scavengers. There's bazillions of sensors out there, so off-the-shelf sensors, and putting that all together to do networks of energy scavenged uh, wireless sensors for broadly building automation. So whether it's lighting control or whether it's electric power monitoring, we've got uh, 500 sensors in a, a building 90 up the hill at, uh, at LBL. I think they're putting in uh, uh, power monitoring on, on all the plugs in this building now, again, using wireless. Um, and uh, so making a, a demo wireless sensor networking uh, energy harvested application, that's kind of the, the project broadly. And you know, that's clearly collaborative. Uh, people from EE for sure are interested. People from CS, you know, there's, there's uh, a piece for that. From mechanical engineering for sure on the you know, building uh, systems. Um, it's hard to find an area of engineering that doesn't have some bearing on that particular problem. So collaborative team for sure. 
industrial partners, uh, the list is way too long. We're going to have to be choosy. And there's, there's all the building uh, companies. So you know, Johnson Controls and Honeywell, the people that do the controls for buildings today, uh, Bosch and so on. Then there's all the semiconductor vendors because they're really excited about this idea that we're going to have 10 or 100 or maybe even 1,000 wireless sensors per person. You know, billions, trillions of wireless sensors is what people are talking about. And so you know, TI and Freescale uh, sort of work the math on that. And they, they think that that's probably a, a good game to get into. Um, so they're excited. You might be surprised, Broadcom, Qualcomm, and sort of that, that crowd of companies is also super excited about this. And they see their uh, wireless handheld devices and so on being kind of the interface to that wireless sensor network and the way you control the building as you walk through it by localization or, or just as the, as the manager of the system. So all sorts of interest there. And then the Bay Area is filled with all these uh, uh, wireless sensor networking startups and energy scavenging startups. So we've got, I don't know how many companies are interested in this project, but there's, there's a lot of them. And so, um, yeah, the, the idea is really, you know, all the, all the tools are there to put something together. You have the opportunity to uh, participate both on the engineering side of putting together the uh, proof of concept hardware and the proof of concept demo that shows that something actually works. Like, can you reduce the energy consumption in this building by 10%? Almost guaranteed that you can. And you know, that's, a, that's a respectable uh, number of megawatt hours by the, you know, over, over a period of a year. Um, and then getting access to the people in these companies going in, you know, if you say you're a graduate student working on this project uh, in this program at Berkeley, you're going to get access to people and get a lot of valuable time from people in the industries that we care about. And getting the feedback uh, from them to help guide the project is, is a big part of what we're looking for. So um, that's way more uh, detail and accuracy actually, even as high level it is, than, than what will actually happen. Because what will actually happen is that you know, the, the three or five or however many of you that show an interest in this project are going to come together and sit down with me and Professor Bozer and we're going to brainstorm and we're going to, you know, you're going to have good ideas, you're going to have different background, we're going to come up with some, it's going to go off in some weird direction that we're going to get excited about and that's what we're going to actually end up doing. So I have no idea what that looks like but I'm eager to work with you to figure it out. So thank you. I'm the only one who didn't get a question. Ah. <laughs> Is it all hardware or are there software aspects to this project? Absolutely software aspects, right? And the, the, how do you choose to do the routing and networking in the network is, is still an open question. So we can buy that off the shelf if we need to, but it's not going to be optimal for what we want. So there's an opportunity to do something there. The data comes back uh, in, say, IP format and gets into a SQL database or something like that, how do you connect that to the, the building systems and how do you actually process that data? What algorithms do you use to filter it? What control laws do you use and so on? How does all that software uh, get implemented? So there's, there's both theory there and implementation. Um, so I mean, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for software in that project. Question? How much, so on average in wireless sensor networks today, how much real-time data gets stored? Really application dependent. Um, I think that there are probably, there's a handful of applications where they probably just store it all, right? Because these devices, they just, they don't produce enough data to overwhelm the kinds of, of web-based systems that are out there today. But on the other hand, so industrial process automation is one place where there's, there's just a ton of wireless sensors now. So every refinery in the world, every chemical plant, they all have these little wireless sensors in them. But they all came from a comp completely different era of electronics and monitoring. And so there, the wireless has really just replaced the wired systems that they already had, which go into some kind of, uh, you know, uh, programmable logic controller or something like that. And after the decision is made on what to do with that data, it just gets thrown out. So, so it's, it's the whole spectrum from you know, zero uh, bits get stored to 100% of them get stored. And there's some interesting, you know, interesting ideas on what you do with those data streams if you do collect all that stuff. I and mean, one, one of the things that I really like about the Streetline system in San Francisco is that 
uh, you can actually, while you're driving into the city, you can say, what route should I take to my favorite restaurant? Because you don't actually want to know where there's an open parking space by your favorite restaurant when you're on the bridge heading into the city, right? It's going to be gone by the time you get there. But what Streetline can do is they can actually uh, you know, figure out where you are, estimate how long it's going to take you to get there with web-based information, uh, and then look at historical occupancy rates for parking spaces around your favorite restaurant, look at the arrival times of all the cars that are currently sitting in those spaces, and then come up with statistically the best path for you to maximize the probability that there will be an open space just as you drive by. So that kind of thing, that's really cool. <laughs> but, but the people that are paying the bills are the meter mates. So in, in L.A., uh, there's an iPhone app that literally has a map of the city, and on each side of every block, there's a number representing how many expired meters there are. And so you get to, as a, as a, as a, a you know, ticket writer, it's like Pac-Man. You just chomp, 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 chomp. So... You know, it's, all, it's all about revenue, right? It's all about, uh, about money, which is uh, you know, the, the reality of everything from the green stuff that Dave was talking about to the nukes to, uh, you know, to wireless sensors. And that's, you know, and, and that's a critical part of the leadership program that you're in, is that acknowledging that. Question? So will the custom project take some, some funding applications to the wireless sensor nodes, or uh, it's more for the stuff developing the components? I, I, I think it could go in either direction. It will really depend upon the makeup of the people who end up on that team. And so, you know, I can see it going almost completely on the, uh, the sort of the, the, the business uh, case side of developing the, the case for where is it that this technology should be applied and what are the constraints there and how does that ecosystem get put together and, and all that. Uh, that's one side. The other side, I can see students coming in and getting really excited about some particular thing. You know, if we could just monitor the, the current accurately in all the, you know, primary circuits in the building, we could do X, Y, Z. Or, you know, I, can't, I don't even know what that would be. And all we have to do is just take, you know, have to make this little improvement in this thing and combine it with a wireless mesh and we can solve that. So it could be almost a completely engineering uh, problem that gets solved and I can see everything in between, and I'm hopeful that what happens is that it's a little bit of both, right? That one person on the team really likes to dig in and focus on the engineering side, one person on the team really likes to do uh, much more of the business side, and that that's everything in between. So what's uh, Berkeley's policy on, uh, in terms of intellectual property? <laughs> <laughs> An excellent question. Um, uh, Christine spoke about the report this morning, Christine Poe. Okay. I'm uh, intercepting here because actually our dean told me to say this and I didn't say it, so this is the time I think I'm supposed to say it, um, which is the report that uh, Christine talked about that she worked on. Um, turned out that recently we presented this at, it's all about intellectual property and the way that you get IP out of universities and, and kind of like the most effective way, it depends even what kind of technology and what kind of industry it's going into, that is which paths really work better. We presented this work most recently at an NSF uh, conference at Georgia Tech, and we heard that this was actually the, um, the best paper of the whole conference and that it was, um, um, they categorized it as, uh, I forgot the words now, something like groundbreaking and thought-provoking and you know, like words in that category. But uh, what I wanted to tell you, what basically what, what our dean wanted me to tell you, is that that report is available on the CET website. So if you're at all interested in the IP mechanisms, um, it's, it's actually, we understand it now perhaps better than anybody, and we've written it down. And you can actually um, just go download it and figure out how this works. But it's reasonably conducive to uh, entrepreneurially minded people. And there, there's, there, there was a time you know, 20 years ago where, where there was not a whole lot of entrepreneurial activity at Berkeley, but those days are long gone. Uh, I think there's a, there's a real climate here now. Uh, you know, an awful lot of, of Berkeley startups out there and uh, you know, the occasional, you know, I guess Eric was a, was a billionaire for a little while, but now he's only worth a few hundred million. So. 
So maybe maybe this is a good time to uh, just spend the last uh, eight or ten minutes in a general Q and A with uh, the faculty who have spoken so far. If there's follow-on questions for Professor Peister or Goldberg or Ann or or myself, one comment I wanted to make uh, that he has emphasized very nicely is that uh, these capstone projects are not essentially uh, defined as a plan. Do this, do this, do this. It sort of will reflect the makeup of the group and what their interests are. I mean, as I was listening to this particular uh, presentation, I could think of a lot of applications in the green space or in the energy space or in the uh, computational manufacturing space. I mean, what if these wireless sensors were on the wings of your airplane as, as you're flying along, you're watching in the, in the, as, on your laptop, cracks growing, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> or uh, things. So uh, for the testing phase, so we should think a lot about how those could work. Uh, one of the interesting applications is the whole so-called smart grid and what it means for factory operation or, or, or facility operation that involves sensors collecting information and optimizing the system to, to move around. But let's, uh, let's take the last uh, uh, eight minutes or so here before we take a break and uh, address questions either to the group in general or to specific faculty or follow-on. Uh, in terms of the capstones and what some of the different groups are, are going to be doing. And if you want to continue something with one of the folks you didn't, you thought of now and you just, you want to get back to it, please go ahead and do that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I just want to share some questions. Uh, so, like, did you come up with that project that uh, uh, has So the, the, he wanted to cl clarify his last question. If something patentable comes out of the project, does the, the IP belong to Berkeley or is it shareable or some sort of profit sharing? And I think that the answer is that in this document, which is posted on the CET website, talks about the model for handling potential IP issues relative to capstone projects. So I mean, it, it, there's, there's, a, there's several other different uh, scenarios that can be followed, but I think uh, I would recommend uh, first, in fact, you can you can grab Professor Sidhu on the way to the next place if uh, if you uh, need to get the link. But but read read through that first, and then we can have a follow-on discussion because it has been thought about, and there are some models in place that we've agreed to do for the for the capstone. And then what happens after that is entirely up to the company or the individual. But that de defines it much more clearly than we could in just kind of a simple uh, short answer here because it's it's not quite straightforward, but it's very innovative and it seems to be widely accepted as a way to, to, way to do that. Okay. Yes, sir. What sort of resources are available or dedicated to assist these capstone projects in development? Is it cost disappointment that is dedicated to the department that houses that capstone? Or? Yes, so let me, so the question was what kind of resources are available to help uh, implement these capstone courses and support them? Each department will be a little bit different. Uh, Professor Peaster mentioned a very important word, the idea of a group of students meeting with a faculty member who's enthusiastic and, and knowledgeable about it and his or her graduate students who will be helping with it is a first resource. If there are materials and other things necessary, uh, we will make arrangements for those to be provided. But I'll let some of my colleagues see if they want to uh, chirp in on, on this in terms of resources. Sure. My understanding is that we're each bringing our, the resources of our labs so that you'll be able to work with our, with our other students, with our PhD students in our research labs on these projects. I think that's right. That's what my, that's what my intention is and I think most of the faculty that I know, will, we don't expect, you know, we're not going to be building buildings and large uh, research apparatus that costs, costs millions of dollars, but there will be some resources required. It's mostly going to be personnel and mentorship, but if there are gadgets that need to be prototyped or acquired, uh, we'll be making arrangements to handle that. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, we have lots of gadgets and we have plenty of money to make more gadgets. So that's... I, I think the situation is similar in the, in the nuclear too. We have uh, uh, good uh, experimental facilities as well as in, uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, collaborators. So uh, I think uh, we have a good, good uh, resources already. More questions or general comments? Yes, sir. Uh, can you say a little more about uh, how student-driven uh, these capstone projects can be? That is, is there a potential for students perhaps originate a project so long as uh, faculty members on board, 
or uh, is it simply that we can influence a little on the direction that a uh, given project can take? I'll let uh, Professor Sidhu comment, but my impression is that both of those are correct. If there is something, so there's a level of, of, of capability or value that needs to be met. So every idea will have to be judged and sort of distilled a bit. But my sense is if that some student or a group of students come with something that really fits the target by our definitions, which are, are flexible and, and, and open-minded, uh, that that's certainly a possibility. It like you want to chime Yeah, in? I, I just want to say that that is a model that we are um, allowing. And in fact, uh, we talked with um, a number of faculty, and I think the representative is Dave Measuresmith, who um, had volunteered some project ideas, but actually said he preferred if, stu if some students were, were to propose one of their own and that they were really interested in it, he would literally drop the ones that he was proposing and would rather um, connect with a group that had some passion of their own project. So, yeah, it's a model we've talked about, and it's a model that we'll support. And I suggest a, a really good mechanism for that is once you have agreed to move your hand from this way to this way, when Professor uh, Goldberg asks you how many of you have agreed to come to the program, is to start communicating with individual faculty that you have interest in, if you've got some kind of burning idea, and see how you can both find out how to package it well so that it, it meets the goal, as well as uh, identify a series of faculty or a faculty member or two who will be the mentors for that. And I think that's really, that's going to be really exciting. So if you have an internship this summer and you come up with some interesting problems, or you read, you know, The Economist on the plane on the way home and you see something that looks interesting. But you should start engaging with the faculty as soon and as aggressively as you'd like to. The faculty will, will tell you to back off if you're kind of, you know, <laughs> tracking them or camping out in front of their house or something. But um, I think uh, we would like to see enthusiastic engagement early on. Now, there are other students who would like to join in a project, you know, sort of like going to, a, some people like to cook their own food, some like to go to a smorgasbord and choose off the, off the, off the salad bar or the bar. So I think we're open to both canes, but we definitely want to encourage uh, initiation on the part of the students. Yes, sir. So you've mentioned a lot of details about the faculty support. Uh, I'm curious about if industry support during the project, what kind of deliverables are we expected to, to present to our industry partners? So the question was, we mentioned a lot about faculty support now. What, uh, what do we anticipate being industry support or what kind of deliverables the industry would look for? Uh, so I don't have a, a good answer for that. Uh, there may be others who've had experience. It will depend upon which industry involvement and what level of involvement they're involved in, they're, they're, they're participating in. Uh, in terms of uh, there's, there's standard formats for the kind of, or reasonably standard for the kind of report or report out or, or presentation materials that are going to, be, going to be done. If it's something like in the nuclear industry, uh, unless you guys have some extra reactors sitting around Echeverry Hall, uh, there probably will be more involvement from the industry participant or the regulatory agency participant. In some other cases, like Professor Peaster's lab, where he's got bazillions of these little sensors flying around his laboratory, uh, there probably will be more coming from the, from the laboratory side. But anyone care to, to address that? I mean, Ken, what about uh, uh, server and, and, <clears throat> and computer computational resources, et cetera? We've got, ton Whoa. We've got tons of that stuff. I mean, it's not going to be an issue. You're not going to be constrained by, uh, by equipment and, and resources. That is the least of your worries. So don't, don't, uh, please don't let that be an issue for you. We, uh, the, the nice thing about coming to a place like Berkeley is that you're coming on board and you're getting leverage of a vast array of, of PhD level research that's ongoing. So you're able to take advantage of that. And the trick is to be really smart about making use of resources, touching base with all the faculty that are involved with the program. So the, the, the enormous resources. In terms of computing, I mean, you, you can't even, you'll, you'll never be able to use all the, uh, all the computational power we have. We challenge you to try. That's a challenge, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just add, uh, um, material science and engineering, for example, there's a number of departments that have very strong relationships with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is sort of like resource squared in terms of capability. And to the extent projects might be involved or require some resources there, they're very strongly interested in these kind of collaborations. Uh, so I think, you know, without 
over, without oversimplifying it, we have not seen the resource issue in terms of what we need to provide or we get our, our industrial colleagues to provide from our experience who are really interested and motivated by this. We haven't seen that to be a, to be a limitation. Yeah, I think and our I, industrial partners will end up donating pretty much anything we want. So certainly in the wireless sensor project, if you call up uh, one of the sensor networking companies or the energy harvesting companies or some application that you want to do and say, I'm in the engineering leadership program uh, at UC Berkeley and I'd like, you know, a free XYZ or I'd like to come in and, and do something. You've got a very good chance of being successful in that. And Qualcomm gave us a cell phone base station and I don't know, I mean, pretty much whatever Whatever students want, we figure out ways of, of making it happen. And, and industry is, is eager to uh, get you hooked on whatever they're doing in the hopes that they can hire you when, when you're done. So which, it's a good investment for them. Which is a perfect segue. I see Ms. Nidover at the back of the room, and uh, we were supposed to finish up at, at 2.45. If there's one more burning question that we could take, otherwise I think probably uh, I would like to thank our participants from the different departments and thank you for a very uh, energetic <clears throat> and interactive group and now we're supposed to take a short walk over to the student life information exchange building which which is next Blum Hall just across the way where we had where we had lunch and uh, thank you very much and I think we'll close the the session with that thank you